According to John Hopkins Medicine, almost all men will have erectile dysfunction after a prostatectomy. And after one year, nearly all men with intact nerves will experience substantial improvement. Hmm, what if the nerves aren't intact after the procedure? That's not uncommon. The current healthcare system isn't about health, wellness, and longevity. It's crisis intervention and revenue generation. Imagine this scenario. You're a guy 55 years old. You go see your doctor for a checkup and he looks you over and says, everything seems okay. Let's send you for a bit of blood work. He slips in a PSA test, a prostate specific antigen test, without discussing this with you. A couple of days later, your doctor calls you up and says your PSA came back a little bit high. It's at 5.3, the upper end of normal is 4.0. He runs the test again and it comes back the same. He has you do a round of antibiotics just in case you have a prostate infection causing the elevated PSA. You take the antibiotics and the result stays the same. The PSA is still about 5.3. He has you see a urologist. The urologist does an ultrasound guided biopsy. He sticks a probe in your rectum and fires a needle into your prostate gland, getting little bits of tissue for them to look at under the microscope. The prostate gland is located between your rectum, your urinary bladder, your pelvic floor, and your pubic bone. A few days later, you get another call saying that you've got a moderate grade prostate cancer. Treatment options are discussed with you, but you and your wife can't live with the idea that you've got a cancer in your body, and so you opt to have your prostate removed. What they don't tell you is that about half of men in their 50s actually have some amount of prostate cancer hiding somewhere in their prostate gland. And as time goes on and as you get older, if you live long enough, it becomes inevitable that you have prostate cancer somewhere in your prostate gland. And yet, a little less than 3% of all men end up dying of prostate cancer. You have the surgery done, it goes quite well, but then afterwards you're left impotent. About one in three men are left impotent as a result of this surgery. One in five men have urinary incontinence and have to use pads to catch the dribbling urine. And one in six actually have rectal incontinence. Should you have even had the PSA test done in the first place? That's what we're gonna look at today in this video. He is the best physician that knows the worthlessness of most medicines. It was Benjamin Franklin that said that. That insightful statement seems more appropriate to me than ever after 38 years working in the mainstream healthcare system and having my eyes open to the futility of many common medical practices. Today, I'm talking about screening for prostate cancer with prostate-specific antigen. From what I learned from the outstanding book, The Great Prostate Hoax, How Big Medicine Hijacked the PSA Test and Caused a Public Health Disaster. Dr. Ablin, PhD, discovered prostate-specific antigen in 1970. And he was upset with the fact that this is being used as a screening test, and that's why he's written this book. There are two common usages for the PSA test. One is to follow the activity of prostate cancer in men with a known diagnosis, and to assess for the effectiveness of treatment and for the possibility of tumor recurrence. And number two, as a screening test for prostate cancer. And it's number two that he's got an issue with. In fact, less than a week ago, I was in getting some routine blood tests drawn, and I asked the technologist drawing my blood if there was a PSA included. And she said, yes, there is. And I said, don't run that test. Hopefully by the end of this video, you're gonna understand why. In the United States every year, there's 288,000 new cases of prostate cancer, and that about 35,000 men every year die from prostate cancer. Most of these cancers are localized to the prostate gland and never actually cause a problem. The lifetime risk of fatal prostate cancer is only about 3%. And yet prostate cancer is ubiquitous with only a small number of men actually having problems from it and dying from it. As you will see, the value of early detection is questionable. Amongst males 40 to 49 years old, 40% of men have prostate cancer whether they know it or not. Likewise, between the ages of 60 and 69, about 70% of men have prostate cancer. And after the age of 70, at least 80% of men have prostate cancer. The point is, there's a lot of prostate cancer out there, but much of it would never cause a problem if you just left it alone. The basic problem is that the PSA test is specific to the prostate, but not specific for cancer. In 2009, two studies of PSA screening from the US and Europe were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they came to the conclusion, PSA-based screening results in small, 
or no reduction in prostate cancer specific mortality. As you can imagine, this led to quite an uproar in the urology community. In 2011, the United States Preventative Task Force recommended against routine PSA screening. The American Urology Association was outraged by these events, viewing this as inappropriate and irresponsible to issue a statement against PSA screening. I'm not so sure that I agree with their condemnation. According to Virginia Moyer, MD of the U.S. Preventative Task Force, the bottom line is that science tells us there is very little benefit and significant harms with mass routine screening. Before a man goes ahead with PSA screening, he needs to be fully aware of what he's getting into, and currently that is not how things are being done. There should be informed consent for PSA testing. You can be harmed by it. When I do a procedure sticking a needle into patients, I need to explain to them the risks and benefits. Likewise, there should be an explanation of the risks and benefits of PSA testing. PSA testing leads to biopsies, which lead to radical prostatectomies. An important question is, do prostatectomies prompted from screening save lives? In the well-regarded PIVOT study, it was shown that there was no difference in prostate cancer or all-cause mortality by having a prostatectomy over 12 years of follow-up. The differences were statistically insignificant. The study has been extended up to 20 years with similar results. Dr. Ablin explains that there are four cruxes to his uh, argument against routine PSA screening. Firstly, PSA cannot detect cancer. PSA is prostate specific, but not cancer specific and can be elevated for a number of benign reasons. For example, if you have prostatitis, your PSA will go up. If you have a large prostate from just age related uh, prostate growth, your PSA would be elevated. If you've had sex within the last 24 hours, your PSA can go up. And even going on a bike ride can elevate your PSA. The second crux is that there's no specific level that detects prostate cancer. You can have a low PSA and uh, have cancer, and you can have a high PSA and not have cancer. And the value of PSA that triggers a biopsy is very arbitrary. Number three, you can't distinguish indolent from aggressive cancer with a PSA test. And number four, prostate cancer is age-related. As I explained, the older you get, it becomes almost inevitable that you will actually have prostate cancer, whether it causes a problem or not. There was a Swedish study showing that there was only a 0.1% reduction in prostate cancer mortality by being screened. In other words, if you take 1,000 men and screen them for 10 years, only one prostate cancer death will be prevented. This study occurred at seven medical centers and only two of the seven centers actually showed benefit. The other five showed no benefit. Professor Hal Aries, PhD, used the following illustration. Picture two auditoriums filled, each with a thousand men. One auditorium is filled with men who had PSA screening tests and the other auditorium is filled with men who did not have screening. In each auditorium, eight men will ultimately die of prostate cancer. As hard as it is for some people to recognize, these two auditoriums represent the statistical reality of prostate cancer. At the most optimistic, you need to do 50 prostatectomies to prevent one prostate cancer death. That means that 49 men are risking impotence and incontinence and the possible need for diapers for one life saved. And like I said, those are the most optimistic numbers. According to John Hopkins Medicine, almost all men will have erectile dysfunction after a prostatectomy. And after one year, nearly all men with intact nerves will experience substantial improvement. Hmm, what if the nerves aren't intact after the procedure? That's not uncommon. 40 to 50% of men will return to pretreatment function after a year. I guess that means that 50 to 60% don't. After two years, 30 to 60% of men will return to pretreatment function and that means that 40 to 70% don't. Potency rates vary wildly from surgeon to surgeon. It gets worse. Up to 80% of men will experience some degree of urinary incontinence after a radical prostatectomy. All of this can be the result of a poorly thought out PSA test, finding cancers that may have never caused a problem. As I said, there should be informed consent. There are powerful economic interests that drive screening. The lab testing earns money, but more importantly, it leads to biopsies and prostatectomies. Urologist Michael Greenspan, MD, says, without radical prostatectomies, 
more than half of all the urology practice in the United States would go belly up. Nowadays, most prostates are removed robotically. It sounds really cool, but there's downsides. Firstly, the Da Vinci system costs about $2 million with a $100,000 annual service contract. That means that surgical centers and hospitals have a vested interest in finding uh, prostate cancer cases and perpetuating PSA screening. The claim is that by having your prostate removed robotically, the complication rate is lower, but the data doesn't support that. The rate of impotence and incontinence may be a little bit higher when the prostate gland is removed robotically rather than with a conventional procedure. The Da Vinci robotic system got approval from the FDA based on 113 cholecystectomies. Now cholecystectomies, i.e. removing the gallbladder, is a technically much less challenging procedure. The gallbladder is easier to access surgically than the prostate gland. And uh, despite the fact that it was proved based on 113 cholecystectomies, hundreds of thousands of prostatectomies have been performed with the uh, Da Vinci system. There are 30 million PSA tests annually in the United States, which leads to over a million biopsies and 100,000 prostatectomies. Now, if they're still studying this thing 20 years later, torturing the data to see if there's any benefit, right there, I see a red flag and reason to be suspicious of PSA screening. Stated similarly by Mark R. Haythorn, if PSA really was the biomarker deserving FDA approval for detecting cancer in otherwise healthy men, there would be no need for debate, reanalysis, and continued extensions of clinical trials. Amen, I say to that. Now, what I've talked about today is for information purposes only and not medical advice. I do recommend that you have a frank discussion with your doctor before having a PSA screening test. The United States Preventative Task Force recommends an informed conversation between the doctor and patient with a discussion of risks and benefits before undertaking the screening test. And the screening test is only relevant for men between the ages of 55 and 69. After the age of 70, they just flat out say men should not be screened. At Crisco & Company, we recommend proactive health maintenance. There is plenty of evidence that lifestyle has an effect on the propensity for prostate cancer. Like many things in modern healthcare, PSA screening is a diversion from what is really important for good health. There's lots of money in PSA testing, biopsies, and prostatectomies, but very little money to encourage people to eat more broccoli, which is a legitimate strategy to help reduce risk of prostate cancer. There are other things you can do as well. Check out my video on preventing prostate cancer. I hope that you found this topic as thought provoking as I have. Please like and subscribe. Let us know, post in the comments, would you get a PSA screening test?